with the situation we have today, you have to, you know, go out to, you know, leave the chartered area, get off the maps, do new stuff. I want to thank you all for coming to another Scientist's Warning program. Hosts, myself, Stuart Scott and Victoria Hirth, we're coming to you live from COP24 in Katowice, Poland, Conference of Parties. Now today's guests with us, Greta and Svante Thunberg. The name Thunberg is not yet a household name, but Greta's accomplishment is known famously around the world. She's an international climate activist, and with her, her father, who is an author and an actor, happens to be her PR person, her chauffeur, her protector, all of the above. A very, very dedicated man. And today's program we're calling Straight Talk, because that's Greta's hallmark and Svante's hallmark. They both talk very straight about the situation, and I think that's why the world is hearing Greta so clearly. Here's how Greta started with a one-woman sit-down strike outside the Swedish parliament. For about two weeks, she was there until they gave an excuse that it was a safety issue and asked her to move across the bridge, basically out of the way so she wouldn't embarrass the politicians because she was drawing so much attention. And she made her point not only in Sweden, but then internationally. Now, this is Svante with Greta's mother, Malena Ehrenman, who gave up a very successful operatic career in order to, well, for the sake of her daughter's budding career as a climate activist, shall we say. I love this picture of, of Greta. Look at the determination in this young lady. Now, the United Nations has taken notice of Greta being here, and Secretary General Gutierrez asked for Greta to join him in a private meeting yesterday, and this is one of the photos. And this is one of my favorite photos of Greta. Here she was after just speaking at a rally in Helsinki, Finland, which was said to be the lar largest climate rally ever in Finland. Svante, can you explain to us how this all came about? Yeah, sure. Um, it goes back a few years um, when Greta fell ill. Uh, I think it's four or five years ago. She um, stopped eating and she stopped talking and she fell into a depression. Um, and she stayed home from school for uh, almost a year. She lost a lot of weight and was on her way to hospital. And, um, so we stayed at home, my wife and I, we stopped uh, working and we stayed at home to, um, we had two daughters and we uh, made sure that they were feeling well again. And, and once um, Greta was coming back, uh, it turned out she was very um, concerned and upset about uh, the climate. She has been going on about this before, obviously, but uh, it sort of stuck to her and she could not uh, get this out of her head. The fact that everyone was saying one thing and doing the exact opposite all the time. Not least us parents. We were two very concerned parents, uh, very uh, uh, sort of interested and, and outspoken on, on, uh, sorry, on um, human rights and um, uh, care for refugees and uh, the importance of taking good care of, of our, our fellow citizens. Uh, but in Greta's eyes, of course, uh, we were missing out one big point. Uh, in fact, the most important point, uh, which was the climate or the sus sustainability crisis going on around us. So uh, while we were saying all these things about, you know, taking care about our fellow men, we were flying around, eating meat and buying things and driving a big car, having two homes. Uh, and of course, that's not really uh, sustainable. So, um, and then we realized that we were, of course, a huge part of the problem. In fact, we were the problem. And um, Greta could not sort of uh, get around that. And it made her very, very upset. So 
Listening to her, we sort of started taking in the sustainability and the climate crisis and we sort of embarked on a road which we are still upon and I believe a lot of you in this room are still are upon the same road. So uh, she told us uh, that we had to change and we could not go on doing what we did, you know, and she, s she showed us all these statistics, you know. When my wife went to Tokyo, for instance, to do a, um, a series of concerts, and it was very important, uh, shown on Japanese TV and all this, you know, 4,000 people on each performance, and, uh, you know, that was very important to her. But then again, when she came home, Greta said, you know, you just spent um, like 20 people's, you know, carbon budget, just in living in, in West Africa, for instance, with their carbon footprint, just by going back and forth to Tokyo, which of course is the same here. Here we are flying back and forth to our Poland from all over the world, spending God knows how many people's carbon budgets. And so Greta said, you can't go on doing that. You cannot stand up for human rights while you're living this lifestyle. And so we, we gave up that life, lifestyle and my wife stopped flying 2016 and I stopped flying uh, six months later. And um, Greta, of course, stopped flying way before that and then became uh, vegetarians, then we became uh, vegan and, uh, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, that, that was the background of the story. And now it's sort of going on. Greta was um, getting more and more... Uh, frustrated about the way that, you know, the politicians keep saying, you know, this is the most important issue of all, and yet the emissions are still rising and, and nothing is changing. So then she decided to go on school strike. So, so Svante, uh, you give a, a really great insight into um, what, what we all live with and what I think as adults, we learn this double think. Mm -hmm. We learn to, to yeah. do and act and, and somehow, the only way we can cope with life is by, is by doing that. Is, is that how you explain why this went under the radar for you for so long? Or what other explanation can you, you give for that? You're in I believe humankind has been doing this for, I mean, forever. We've been saying, you know, we should, uh, you know, love thy neighbor and slaughter each other on the battlefield every day. I mean, we've been doing that for, for since dawn of time or since dawn of Homo sapiens, 200,000 years. Um, but now with 7 billion people, you know, we can't do that. We cannot do this love double lifestyle anymore because, you know, time's up. The budget's been spent and simple as that. So for you then, um, what, did it all come as a very big surprise? What Greta yeah. was unveiling to you? Very much so. I mean, I realized that something was wrong with the environment and, and um, um, like everyone else, you know, you're looking for a better car you know, driven by some biofuel or something like this. But, you know, we bought an electric car three years ago thinking, you know, wow, we're going to fix this. But we cannot buy electrical cars. We cannot own cars at all. If we are serious about the 1.5, we can't be driving, you know, private cars. And no one's talking about it. But, I mean, that, those are the harsh facts. And so Greta basically has taken you and the people that you engage with Greta to a point of innovation that's... that's Blank sheet, starting again. Yeah, what do we need? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and so, uh, Greta, taking your family and others on that journey, with a very logical, very much like your ancestor, very logical approach to this, um, what, what have you found is the most difficult thing and what's been the most surprising? What the most uh, surprising thing is that I realized a while ago that people don't know that we are in this emergent situation. We all say we know and we all think we all know, but we don't because we, of course, we know something is going on. We know that the planet is warming because of greenhouse gases caused by humans. Uh, and, but we don't know the exact consequences of that. And we don't know the rapid changes required to stop it. And so I have met politicians and journalists that doesn't have a clue. They don't know the basic facts. They don't know what the Keeling curve is. They don't know what the albedo effect is. Just things as simple as that, they don't have a clue about. You're what we call a six sigma person. Your knowledge of the climate is six standard deviations out from the average. So if the average journalist does not know 
what you know. Don't be surprised in the future. I'd like to return to one comment you made, Svante. You talked about carbon budget. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of bullshit going on out there that we still have a carbon budget. Not. We have already spent our carbon budget. But the politicians have this, <clears throat> they have this routine down of kicking the can down the road. And they do that by this notion of a carbon budget. And they bolster that with information, research, a report from the IPCC that always seems to say we still have a few more years. We have no more carbon budget. I want to dispense with that illusion. We are borrowing from future generations at this point. We are making their lives much more difficult. I believe um, 350 ppm parts per million is the th safe threshold, they say. And we passed that threshold in 19... 1987. So everything we spent since 1987 has to go back into the ground or be caught up by trees or whatever, magic solutions that don't exist yet. Trees, basically. So, I mean, that's where we are at. And that's not a good situation. So, so Greta, I mean, I can see, you know, you, you work with data and figures and, and it affects you. And you understand and you can think about the consequences. For lots of people, that's quite um, difficult. And we have to act. So what do you think it's going to take beyond knowledge to get people to act? I think that one way to make people realize the situation we are in and to realize the fact is that the media actually writes about it, treat it as a crisis. If one soccer game can gain more media than the climate crisis, then people will see that and say, oh, so soccer is more important than the climate crisis. So that means it's not that important. Mm, absolutely. In fact, uh, yesterday, obviously, we had uh, David Attenborough uh, unveiling the people's seat and saying very explicitly that we're on the verge of a collapse of civilization. There was only one newspaper in the UK that made that its front page. We, ha we have a lot of media people here. It's a good opportunity. What do you think that the media can do to help this? And what can we and you do to help the media? Uh, the media can do start with writing about it all the time, or every headline, every front page only, because this is this is so important. People don't realize how important it is. We all think that oh, pe people know. We don't. I think also the journalists need to get more activists themselves. Yeah, I, we meet so many journalists uh, now, and, and um, we get the feeling, I believe, that most journalists covering this are so frustrated, and you know so much, and you, you really want to turn the world upside down. And we even meet a lot of other journalists who write about all other things as well, because now Greta is famous in Sweden, so you get a lot of the mainstream media as well. And they don't realize how much power they actually have. The journalist wants to write about it. The public service, for instance, in, in Western Europe, have an enormous responsibility. Enormous. Because there aren't that many public service news agents around the world. The few that do exist in Sweden, for instance, their responsibility is just on a biblical scale. Because who else can do this who is not, you know, dependent on money and, um, you know, income from, you know, click journalism and stuff like this? Pe I mean, and the editors, of course, are... Uh, keep sort of saying, no, no, I can't do this, no, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit sensitive and sort of we've got to get the other side in. It's, you're treating it as if, you know, like um, today we say that, you know, there's no black and white issue. But there are black and white issues. Survival is a black and white issue. Climate crisis is a black and white issue. And we need the journalists to sort of, like you said, be more activist. I mean, you should take responsibility and, and you know, I don't know, do whatever it takes, do whatever you can't do. You have to, with the situation we have today, you have to, you know, go out, to, you know, leave, leave the, the chartered area, get off the maps, do new stuff.
More, I was just going to pick out the one point that, unfortunately, the mainstream media is run by money, in one form or another. Money controls, money interests control, and I think humanity has to rebel against the regime of money. But in Western Europe, we have a lot of media that is not run by money. We have the public service media, and I believe that's our best hope. If you want one thing that we, we you know, we have two years to bend the curve, steep down like, you know, like a I don't know. It's just mad, like a roller coaster going down. Uh, public service, Western Europe. I think it's up to you, basically. So, so perhaps then, because one of the questions, one of the last questions, was what what next? What what are your next plans, and and how might that involve something around media or not? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm just going to sit outside the Swedish Parliament every Friday until Sweden is in line with the Paris Agreement. That is, and then what happens, happens. And what's going to happen is that thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of students around the world are going to dry, join Greta in her strike on Fridays. It's already occurring. There are tens of thousands of students who are going out of school on, on Friday now in support on their own climate strikes in many, many countries around the world. Now, we would like to leave a little bit of time. We have perhaps five minutes more. So is there a question? Hi, um, I'm Luisa. I'm with 350.org. Um, and I'm also a youth observer for Germany here. Um, so how do we communicate best that it's not just about stop eating meat, but it's also just about understanding that coal needs to be something of the past that we cannot continue having cheap flights. It just people won't stop flying unless it's not affordable or we just cut these flights down, in a sense. That is, is, is a very complicated question, um, but it's a very sensitive question as well, because if you hire the prices, then only the rich people will be able to afford, and that is not sustainable either. But we not uh, the rich nor the poor can consume as we do now. Yeah. I mean, we need a complete system change. And uh, I believe stop flying and stop eating meat is just a way of making opinion for that. I mean, it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to make a difference if you stop flying, if one person stops flying. But it's, it's just, uh, it makes other people think so that other people do it as well. And if more people do it, it makes a difference. There is, there is one solution I think that's very promising, which is putting a fee on carbon and then taking that f the revenue and distributing it in the population, among the population. And it's a way of subsidizing the price increases that will go yeah. up because of that. Yeah, fee. I think also a very central thing is that, the, you know, we say we need, uh, you know, a system change, so we should not be doing this as a private consumer, you know. But there is no politics. What, there are no politics to solve the, you know, the situation we're in today. There's not one single political party that I know of that will solve this crisis, and, you know. So uh, we need to create a whole new thing. And that's why we also need to lead by example, because that's, you know, we may not like it, but in today's uh, sort of uh, social climate, you need to uh, do, live as you preach. <laughs> live as you... Practice as you preach. Practice yes. as you preach. Yes. Um.